Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is on Christian education. This is lesson number seven in that series, entitled Worship in Education. Hmm. Worship in Education. How does that fit in the schools? This is the lesson for number, I'm sorry, for November uh, 14 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we take this privilege once again to honor you and to learn more about what it means to actually worship you. May these ideas not only affect those in our schools, among teachers and so forth, but us in our homes is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Whether we admit it or not, everyone worships something. Maybe we worship multiple things, or different things. What do we mean by worship? Worship is an English word which comes from the idea of being worth it. Jim, I think you have something on that. It's a Middle English word and uh, has to do with worthiness, respect, reverence paid to a divine being from, from the Old English worthy, sh sip, I guess it, uh, worthiness, respect from worthy, worthy, I guess it's kind of a mouthful there, but uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you gotta, it's an old English, it comes from the old English about the 12th century according to what Merriam-Webster's uh, etymology. Okay, what we consider to be of the most of value in our lives is what we worship. So what is most valuable in your life? Is it your bank account, your house, your God, your family, your car, you know, lots of things it could be. It must have been easy for Adam and Eve to worship God while in the Garden of Eden. Imagine having God come and visit you every evening for a walk and talk. Wow. You think that, you think that was a matter of worship or was, weren't they in a situation where they listened and de determined whether what they were taking instruction or be, yeah. giving instruct given instruction but yeah. the question is were they listening yeah well <laughs> but the point is how could you have that amount of time with god without being just enormously considering his worth and his value and you know well, what did they really have to, to to compare it to yeah you know, it's uh, each other. Maybe there, there was no. Uh, I'm sure there there was nothing negative of, of the, the of the relationship. But uh, uh. I think I think when they were when they were made they, and were alive, I think they had to have enough to get by more than you know yeah. bumping into poles kind of stuff. They had God couldn't let them run around with nothing between the ears. It had to be something. Oh. I agree with you, he, he, but that there was no f flaws in their creation. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't think God said, sit them down now. You know, you guys uh, should, should be worshiping me. No, he, no. he, he gave them freedom to, yeah. uh, uh, to uh, there was I, so much going on. I, I think they worshiped him because of what they saw around us every day. Wow, did you see, did you see, wow. did you see? Thank you, very. thank you, thank you, thank you. But today's values have been twisted and distorted by selfishness and sin. An example of how values can be twisted and distorted is found in Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Carrie? I'm reading from Mark 7, 1 to 13. Some Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered round Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples were eating their food with hands that were ritually unclean. Ooh, terrible. Yes, that is, they had not washed them in the way the Pharisees said people should. For the Pharisees, as well as the rest of the Jews, follow the teaching they received from their ancestors. They do not eat unless they wash their hands in the proper way. Nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first and they follow many other rules which they have received, such as the proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, and beds. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why is it that your disciples do not follow the teaching handed down by our ancestors, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? Jesus answered them how right Isaiah was when he 
prophesied rather about you. You are hypocrites, just as he wrote. These people, says God, honor me with their words, but their heart is really far away from me. It is no use for them to worship me because they teach human rules as though they were God's rules. You put aside God's command and obey human teachings. And Jesus continued, You have a clever way of rejecting God's law in order to uphold your own teaching. For Moses commanded, Respect your father and your mother, and whosoever curses his father or his mother is to be put to death. But you teach that if a person has something he could use to help his father or mother, but says this is Corban, which means it belongs to God, he is excused from helping his father or mother. In this way, the teaching you pass on to others cancels out the word of God. And there are many other things like this that you do. And that comes from the 1992 edition of American Bible Society. Wow. Well, back in Jeremiah's day, as the city of Jerusalem was about to be destroyed, people began to think that God would not allow the temple to be destroyed, that famous Solomon's temple. So the theme was, we're safe. Uh, this is the Lord's temple. And Jeremiah talked about it like this. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. So what should be the role of explaining worship in Christian education? Why, why do we worship things? It seems that we were designed with a desire to value certain things and, in a sense, to worship them. Human beings having worshipped other humans, human beings have worshipped other humans, idols, money, buildings, power and government, and the list could go on and on. Think about many of the ancient governments in which the leader of the government, such as the Pharaoh or the Caesar, expected to be worshipped as a god. Other nations and peoples worshipped fish and multi-headed gods. Others worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars. Jim. The present age is one of idolatry as verily as was in the that in which Elijah lived. No outward shrine may be visible. There may be no image for the eye to rest upon, yet thousands are following after the gods of this world, after riches, fame, pleasure, and the pleasing fables that permit men to follow the inclinations of the unregenerate heart. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshippers of Baal. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. What is it that we really worship in our minds, I mean, in our thinking? We worship the, the image of God that we have built up from all our teachings and so forth and so forth, and, and that's what we have. So if you have a wrong conception of God, what are you worshipping? An idol. An idol. Well, it's a wrong idea. It's a wrong picture that you have of God. Well, it's, okay. it's, a, it's a, even a graven, graven image. And a false yeah. concept of God is, it could, becomes a graven image. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are, un, are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus, they are led to t turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Exalt the human. Um, what, isn't there a saving that goes, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And admire, yeah. And you have a false concept of God. Yep. Exactly. And you, and you give that worth, and it becomes worship. We, yep. we, uh, okay. that's, found from, that's found in Prophets and Kings 177. It's a very interesting section to read if you have a, a, a few minutes. People today would probably not bow down to a statue of a frog. However, they might worship the bull stock market, or maybe the bear stock market, and some do bow down to a statue of Mary. People have worshipped money, power, sex, themselves, rock stars, actors, politicians. Do we worship any of these things? Who dominates our televisions and our cell phones? A famous writer by the name of David Foster Wallace said, if you worship the wrong thing, it will eat you alive. 
Well, think of the story of Daniel 3. It's a fairly long chapter. We don't have time to read it. But if you remember the story of those three young worthies that went to Babylon with Daniel, and now, for some reason, Daniel is not there, but they are out there on the plain of Dura, and the, everybody's gathered around, and there's this statue all made of gold standing in front of them, and Nebuchadnezzar is about to call for the music to be played, and what's supposed to happen? Everybody's supposed to bow down. I want you to imagine right now that you were in that situation. Would you stood up straight and tall while everyone else is bowing down to the golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar had built? While we do not often mention this, it is almost certain that there were a number of other Jews there who did bow down. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not bow down. And as a result, of course, they were thrown into that fire made to be seven times hotter. And then they were seen walking around in the fire in the company of Jesus Christ. Is God really so particular about how and when, when and who we, whom we worship? Do not forget that this is the issue in both the first and second commandments. Remember Exodus 20, 3 to 6. Well, there's more. Revelation 14. Verses 6 to 12. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, Honor God and praise His greatness, for the time has come for Him to judge. Worship Him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen. She made all peoples drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. A third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, Whoever worships the beast and its image and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, which he has poured out at full strength into the cup of his anger. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who has the mark of his name. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Well, it seems clear from these very powerful words, uh, which we as Seventh-day Adventists have taken as one of our key texts, that it does matter who we worship. Are we correctly worshiping the true God, or are, are any of us worshiping the beast? David and the other songwriters had some very important things to say about worship. In fact, the Hebrew word for the Psalms was Tehillim, which means songs of praise. And certainly that should be one of the main themes of worshiping the Lord. Psalm 78, 1 to 17, um, is an interesting passage. We don't have time to read it, but notice that we are to teach our children, the next generation, remember, to uphold and observe his laws and his commandments. We are to teach them to put their trust in God and to keep the covenant which God has made with his children. The children of Israel were supposed to review all the things that God had done for them in rescuing them from Egyptian slavery. Surely that should have been adequate reason to worship the true God. But what about the Seventh-day Adventist church in our day? Are we up to date? in our knowledge of how the Lord has led us as a church? Well, Ellen White had some interesting things to say about that. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ. As leader, as leader, I'm sorry, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the ways the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Now, I used to read that and think, well, it didn't always seem like the church did so well. I mean, is that? And then I went back and read this more carefully. As we should forget 
the way the Lord has led us, not the way we've gone necessarily, but the way the Lord has led us. When we, when, when we were following the Lord's leading, we were doing pretty well, right? But when we went on our own, we were not doing so well. So, and his teaching in our past history. We are now a strong people. If we will put our trust in the Lord, for we are handling the mighty truths of the word of God. We have everything to be thankful for. If we walk in the light as it shines upon us from the living oracles of God, we shall have large responsibilities corresponding to the great light given us of God. We have many duties to perform. Perhaps we have been made the depositories of sacred truth to be given to the world and all its beauty and glory. We are debtors to God to use every advantage he has entrusted to us to beautify the truth of holiness, of character, and to send the message of warning and of comfort, of hope and love, to those who are in the darkness of error and sin. Ellen White sent that message from Australia to the General Conference meeting and session January 29, 1893. And you can read about it in Testimonies to Ministers, Selected Messages of Book 3, or even Life Sketches. Well, if one were to review our church's history by reading the testimonies for the church, just sit down with those ten books and go, I mean nine books, I'm sorry, and go through, you will see how the Lord has led us. Another way that I found very, very fascinating is reading the, the six-volume biography of Ellen White, written by her grandson. Or even the Review and Herald articles, of course, they are chronologically as well. Fascinating, especially at times of crisis in our church, such as 1888 to 1892 and so forth like that. Fascinating stuff. Anybody who does that would find out what an enormous impact worship of God has had on our church throughout history. So, the why question. Why do we worship God? What has he done for us? What do we owe him? Everything. Everything yes. He created us. He gives us life. He wants, us, wants to save us. Uh, Luke said in Acts, well, Paul said it really, but Luke records it in Acts 17. Two places there. God keeps us alive. Every breath we take and so forth. You know? Yeah. And then there's this famous story, and I'm going to take time to read at least part of it. A Samaritan woman came to draw some water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink of water. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The woman answered, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan, so how can you ask me for a drink? Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. Now, there's some interesting things, to, to, to questions to ask about this story. The woman looked at Jesus. She recognized that he was a Jew. How did she know that? By the way he dressed, probably. Probably by the way he's dressed. He's approach, I guess. There's an argument. P people had arguments about, did Jesus stand out? Did he, and was he obvious? She didn't see anything unusual about him. She thought he was just another man, right? But after what he revealed to her, clearly he was not just another man. But it wasn't until he started talking to her that she had any idea that he was anything other than just an ordinary human being. So he was fully human in that sense. Well, Jesus answered, If only you knew what God gives and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him, and he would give you life-giving water. Sir, the woman said, you haven't got a bucket and the well is deep. Where would you get the, that life-giving water? And it's important to notice also that why is she there at the well in the middle of the day? When, when do women normally come to the well? Evening time, isn't it? Either first thing in the morning or late in the evening. They don't come in the hot middle part of the day. Why is she there in the middle of the day? She has a reputation. Yeah, probably catching up on some jobs she should have done. <laughs> He's, uh, well, probably she was embarrassed to be among the other women, most likely. Maybe there were other women who were bullying her. Also possible. It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well. He and his sons and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? 
Jesus answered, all those who drink this water will be thirsty again. And I will tell you that I've had the privilege a number of years ago, before things were divided up so severely in Palestine, we traveled there and drove there and stopped there and went down into that well and had some of that water. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring which will provide him with life-giving water and give him eternal life. Sir, the woman said, give me that water. I mean, wouldn't you say that too? Then I will never be thirsty again, or will I have to come here to draw water? Go and call your husband, Jesus told her, and come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when, you know, he, he must have said that with a very straight face, but he knew exactly what was going on. And how do you suppose she responded? Like, like very casually, I haven't got a husband? You know, just, I wonder when I, when I think about these things. Jesus replied, you are right. When you say you haven't got a husband, you have been married to five men, and the man you live with now is not really your husband. You've told me the truth. Uh, I see you're a prophet, sir. <laughs> I wonder how long it took for her to say that. The one, my Samaritan ancestors, so quickly, let's change the subject here, right? My Samaritan ancestors worship God on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where we should worship God. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman, the time will come when people will not worship the Father either on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans do not really know whom you worship, but we Jews know whom we worship because it is from the Jews that salvation comes. But the time is coming and is already here when by the power of God's Spirit, people worship the Father as He really is, offering Him the true worship, and of course, and that's why he's, we have it in this lesson, offering him the true worship that he wants. God is spirit, and only by this power of his spirit can people worship him as he really is. And you know how it went on there. Well, this is the story of Jesus making that unusual journey through the middle of Samaritan territory on his way from Jerusalem to Galilee. He sat down beside that well at Sychar and had that conversation with that immoral woman and revealed to her something that he may not even have told his disciples at that time. And of course, I didn't read the rest of that. What did he say to her? She said, we know that the Messiah is coming, and Jesus said, I am he. Yeah. I, I am. Always envisage him, even in his quiet times. I don't think Christ was ever without, what's the word I'm looking for? He was positive. Yeah. There was no fooling around, even if it was quiet. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. But in addition to revealing to her that he was the Messiah, he talked about how we are to worship God, in spirit and in truth. So what do we mean when we say that God is spirit? Does that affect how we are to worship him? Well, one, one, one thing I think, I think of when I think of spirit that makes it possible for him to be everywhere at one time. We say he's omnipresent. Yeah. He couldn't be that way if he were human and had a human body. What else do you think of when you think of spirit? Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth, okay. Well, it's a dark. part of one's character. Yeah. Uh, there's always a dark side, the devil and his minions. Yeah. Satan is the spirit of yeah. evil. Yeah. Okay, does that affect how we are to worship Him? Would that mean that in order to worship God correctly, we must get to know Him personally? At least get to know what, he, what His message is and what He's trying to communicate. The religion that comes from God is the only religion that will lead to God. In order to serve Him aright, we must be born of the Divine Spirit. This will purify the heart and renew the mind, giving us a new capacity for knowing a loving God. It will give you, excuse me, it will give us a willing obedience to, to all his requirements. It will give. This is true worship. It is the fruit of the working of the Holy Spirit. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 189. Okay, as we've already noted, people have worshipped many different things down through the generations. In order to worship God in truth, we must have a correct knowledge, one, of Him, two, of who He is, three, of the history of Jesus Christ on this earth, and, and four, of how he, that should impact our lives on a day-by-day -day basis. 
So the correct doctrine or teaching is very important. We do not believe in a God who would burn people in hell for eternity, or at all for that matter. So, what do we learn from the life and death of Jesus? I put it like this, and I've mentioned this a few times already. We have a choice. We can choose to live lives like Jesus lived, or we will die the death that Jesus died. He didn't die of crucifixion. He died of separation from his father. That's why he was dead so quickly. Separation from his father, who was the source of life. So, And that's the death of the wicked in the end. To some people, worshiping God in, a, in spirit leads to a shallow sentimentalism with a lot of emotion exhibited. By contrast, those who claim to worship God in truth without any spirit may end up with a formal legalism. Well, the story of the Ark, or the Ark of the Covenant, or the Covenant Box, as some translators call it, is an interesting one. You remember that story? Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, felt that by taking the covenant box with them into war, God would be forced to help them defeat their enemies, the Philistines. So what, what are they trying to do? Using the ark as a good luck charm. Yeah, well, they're trying to manipulate God, aren't yeah, they? Yes. Yeah. Trying to manipulate God. The result was that the Philistines fought harder, not only conquered the Israelites, but also took the ark of the covenant back to Philistine territory. They put it in one of their temples. Every night, their god fell off its pedestal and finally got broken. <laughs> you know, can you imagine taking that? It was a fish god, Dagon the fish god. Imagine taking the fish god quickly, glue it back together and stick it up on this pedestal again and say, Oh dear God, Dagon, bless us. Help mommy and daddy and help us to be more like you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just chuckle when I think about that. They transferred the ark to different cities. Every city that received it got some kind of serious problem. So they decided they needed to get rid of the ark. They put it on a new cart that was pulled by two cows which had recently had calves. Now, what, is, what do cows usually do when they've just had calves? They want to stick around their calves, don't they? They're protective, yeah. They said that if this ark was supposed to go back to Israel, so be it. But if these cows stayed with their calves, they would know it was not true. Well, as we know, the cows went straight to Israel. The first place where the cows stopped was in Israelite territory at Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh, or I'm not sure how to pronounce that. And plagues fell on the people there as well because they tried to look into the covenant box. Later, the people from kiriath Jerem came and carried the ark back to their village and treated it respectfully. It stayed with them for more than 20 years. And you can read about that in 1 Samuel 4, 1 through 7, 2. Well, so that's not, the end of, that's not the end of the story. What happened? David becomes king. And Saul has been king for this about 40 years. And all this happened during his time. David now becomes king. And what's he going to do? He conquers Jerusalem. And then he says, Okay, if this is going to be the capital of our country, we need the ark up here. We need the temple here. And so he said, okay, bring that ark up here. And what happened? At first, he, without doing any research, he tried to, to take it up with a military escort on a cart. So why would, why would uh, David choose a military escort? So nobody else came after the ark. Well, that's a possibility, but what kind of a person was he? Was he was used to doing everything in a military style, wasn't he? Oh, yes. Great military guy. That was his profession. Yeah. When the cart jolted, as we know, Uzzah, who had been... By the way, what do we know about Uzzah? Just to make this, to fill out the story a little bit. It was in Uzzah's house. His father and his brother and he had been caring for this ark for all those years. And he was a pre from the priestly family. He was, should have known, he and his brother and his father should have known how the ark was supposed to be carried. They should have objected to it being put in the cart before it even left their place. Yeah. But he's walking along beside there, and so the thing, so, and he feels like, you know, I'm, I've been taking care of this thing for all these years. I can put my hand out and, and hold the thing. Yeah. And he was struck dead. What, what does that say to us about God? 
means what he says. Okay. Anything and else? He's got a lot of power on board. What so, must have killed him must have been electrical or something. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> think about it now. David is trying to establish a whole new way of ruling the country. Yeah. He said, let's, let's bring this ark up. So what does he want? Does he want to start off with the, with, the, with the situation where people say, well, you can touch that ark. There's nothing special about it. No, he wants, he wants that to be brought up in a way that gives the greatest amount of respect and honor following. I mean, what about the people who had read back in Numbers and in, in chapter 7 and verse 9 that knew how the ark was supposed to be carried? And here it is coming along, bouncing along on this cart. cart. So I think David, you know, it was a mistake on David's part. So what did David do? He asked the Levites to study the correct handling of the ark and realize it was not, not supposed to be carried on a cart, but rather was to be carried on the shoulders of human beings. They took it to Jerusalem this time following the directions of God. And let me just read that verse, Numbers chapter 7, verse 9. But Moses gave no wagons or ox to the Kohathites, oxen, I'm sorry, because the sacred objects they took care of had to be carried on their shoulders. And if you read back, you find that one of the sacred things that they were responsible for was the ark. Well, we read what happened in 1 Chronicles 16, verses 1 to 36. Um, let me read just a little bit of that so we'll get a picture. They took the covenant box of the tent, which David had prepared for it, and put it inside. So, so far, what, what kind of temple did they have in Jerusalem? Nothing really. What? Just a tent. Yeah. It's, that's where it's been all this time. It's, it's yeah. been another tent. After David had finished offering the sacrifice, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed food to them all. He gave each man and woman in Israel a loaf of bread, a piece of roasted meat, and some raisins. So, they had an enormous festival. When the, when the ark finally arrived back in Jerusalem. So there was great rejoicing. David danced before the Lord to the disgust of Michael, one of his wives, the daughter of Saul. Notice these words taken from that experience. I'm reading from 1 Chronicles 16, verses 25 to 27. The Lord is great and is to be highly praised. He is to be honored more than all the gods. The gods of all other nations are only idols, but the Lord creates, created the heavens. Glory and majesty surround him. Power and joy fill his temple. That comes from the Good News Bible. Okay. So... And that, he, by the way, that, where it says the, all the gods, that is Elohim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, plural, plural of gods. Of Elohim. So... What are we saying here? God is trying to make a very clear distinction between him and the way he is to be worshipped and what all these other people are doing, right? Yeah. No matter what happens to us and in the light of all that God has done for us, it does not really matter unless we grasp the plan of salvation and are saved in the kingdom of God. First Chronicles 16, 29, we just looked at, we are told, give to the Lord the glory to his name Bring an offering and come before him, or worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's from the New King James Version. What does it mean to say the beauty of holiness? Well, first of all, we should remind ourselves of how ugly and damaging sin is. Consider some of the ways in which people have tried to worship their idols or their gods in the past. Um, if you think about some of the stuff that was going on at this time or plus or minus a couple hundred years, the Greeks at that point in time had temples where you were supposed to go and worship. But if a criminal escaped from, from the police or whoever was chasing him and got inside the temple, he was safe there. So it was, it was a prison. A lot, I mean, as well as it's supposed to be the place you worship God. I mean, imagine what that was like. Yeah. Well, people were absolutely repulsive. These ways they worshipped were absolutely repulsive, evil, and terrible to the point that some had even sacrificed their own children. How do you think God felt about people sacrificing their children? 
You think about it, we do it today, here, every day. Yeah. Not sacrificing, per se, I guess. No, but, no, but this is yeah. the results the same. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, it's interesting to scan through the history of the Old Testament. Every time the children of Israel went to war, without consulting God, they experienced a terrible defeat. But when they followed God's directions in going to battle, they had resounding victories. Shouldn't, that have, shouldn't they have learned a lesson from that after a while? I mean, think about the story of, of Joshua and Ai. Yeah. You know, they went up there twice, and they, and, and they, they, they got beaten. And finally, God, they said, oh, maybe we should consult God. God said, yeah, do it this way. And that was, what, about three or four hundred years prior to this? Yeah. With, with Joshua? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've already seen the words in Mark 7, 1 to 13. Uh, Jesus comments about how the Pharisees and the, and the scribes were worshiping. Even among those who call themselves Christians... How often do we find clever ways to introduce our own ideas in our, into our plans for worship? So think about you out there. When you go to church and you worship on Sabbath, how much of what happens there is determined in, directly or indirectly, consciously or unconsciously, by people's ideas? Do we do certain things to try to attract more young people? Do we do certain things to try to appease the elders? Uh, just to mention some examples. Think of how many people down through the generations have done that. Today we find that materialistic naturalism and the ideas of evolution have, permanent, have permeated public schools. Many of those ideas are totally contradicted by Scripture. Unfortunately, many of the ideas when presented alone may seem attractive, but they are not Christian. They're not biblical, I might add. Um, our Adventist young people having to go to schools where evolution and atheism are taught every day, boy, that's just about like those three Jewish boys standing up on the pain of Dura, huh? So, how, are we, how do we protect ourselves from these insidious evils? Try, well, there, keep, hmm? try and keep away from them. There are certain things we need to recognize. The heart is deceitful, above all things, and desperately wicked. Professors of religion are not willing to closely examine themselves to see whether they are in the faith. And it is a fearful fact that many are leaning on a false hope. Some lean upon an old experience they had years ago, but when brought down to this heart-searching time when all should have a daily experience, they have nothing to relate. They seem to think that a profession of the truth will save them. When those sins which God hates are subdued, Jesus will come in and sup with them and you with him. Sup with you and you with him. You will then draw divine strength from Jesus and you will grow up in him and be able to be able with holy triumph to say, Blessed be God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It would be more pleasing to the Lord. Here's our key point here. It would be more pleasing to the Lord if lukewarm professors of religion had never named his name. What does that mean? They never claim to be Christian, right? Yeah, they're just frauds. Yeah. They are a continual weight to those who would be faithful followers of Jesus. They are a strum stumbling block to unbelievers and evil angels exult over them and taunt the angels of God with their crooked course. Such are a curse to the cause at home or abroad. They draw nigh to God with their lips while their heart is far from him. And of course, that's Jeremiah again. 20, 20, I've forgotten the exact verse. That's Ellen White, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 2, 226 and 227. How well, many... A, par a parallel to that is what Jesus... This, this is from the, uh, Jeremiah, but the parallel is in Matthew 23. It says, yeah. uh, starting at verse 13, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites! 
were the hypocrites or the actors, the frauds, the mm -hmm. this, uh, and of course then the fair, scribes and Pharisees, the teachers. Yeah, and I mean, what, who's left out of that bunch? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and and you know what what bowls me over when I read through the Old Testament. A few times they got good kings, and when they got a good king, the whole people sort of moved a little more in that a little bit more at least in that direction. But when they got bad t kings, boy, they were whoosh, yes, they, they gravitated off it, into the ditch as fast as they could go. Yeah. Well, as we have studied in previous lessons, the basic problem with false worship starts where. In your mind. It in your own, here, our own hearts, as we but, say, but it's really the mind. Heart of a person is where they do their thinking, so yeah. sin starts up here. <laughs> yeah. Do we need to have our religious life in perfect order before we can come to God? How many people think, well, let me, let me, let me clear some of the sins out of my life, and then I'll, then I'll join the church, or then I'll get baptized, or then I'll come to God. Is that a right approach? Not really. <laughs> What, is, what does Jesus say? Come unto me. Yeah. Come unto me. The whole book of Revelation, which is a sort of conclusion to all the Bible, Definitely. just says again and again, come, 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 come. The theme of the book of Revelation is come. Um, think about some of the people who, will be, who, who we know will be in heaven. A prime example might be the thief on the cross. How much time did he have to study the life of Jesus? Now, you probably know, if you've read carefully the book Desire of Ages, that actually he, for a while, will follow Jesus and got more and more familiar with him. And then he, he started thinking, here's this young man. He's all by himself. He comes from Galilee. Nobody knows. There's nobody special comes from Galilee. And here's all the scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law and, and, and Sadducees there. They couldn't all of them be wrong and just this one man right. So he, he left them and he left following Jesus and fell deeper and deeper into sin and theft and so forth. And now all of a sudden he's being crucified beside this Jesus. I wonder if it, it was, was death penalty just for stealing? I'm mean, talking about the thief on the cross. Yeah. That's, yeah, but that, remember the, the uh, sacrificial system or uh, an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. Mm -hmm. That was not good. But it was at least a, a, a progression, uh, not as, as bad harsh as, as uh, the punishment fit the crime. But here, for for stealing, they they kill him. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. Was he doing? Was this? Was he violating or beating people up in order to to, to do his thieving? Yeah, that's, or killing them or to kill do his thieving? Or something. Who knows? That's a good. But question. he was known as a thief. Yeah. Uh, rather, he wasn't known as a killer. Yeah. Talk about a harsh system, if, that's, yeah. if indeed that's what was going on. Sometimes we think that if we belong to the right church, and if we attend fairly regularly our Adventist services, God will not let anything bad happen to us, right? Remember what we read earlier? Jeremiah 7, 4. Stop believing those deceitful words. We are safe. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. This is the Lord's temple. Would it be correct to say, I worship as an Adventist, I worship as an Adventist, I worship as an Adventist? Do you really know the Creator? Yeah, do, do you know, the, do you know the, the larger view? Do you understand the great controversy, etc.? Are you just doing it through rote or, or mm -hmm. uh, as a legal requirement, or has it changed your thinking about God? Yeah. Often the issue of worship in our Adventist churches comes down to discussing, one, whether or not we should allow drums or video projectors to project the hymns or something up on a wall or whatever, or two, who should be in charge? Should it be the youth or the elders deciding what music and what methods are used in worship? And you know how contentious that can be sometimes. We, we need to remember that true worship is a life and death matter. How can we worship God in spirit and in truth? We would probably recognize that all Christians believe that God should be worshipped. Uh, anybody who's been a, a, church, a Christian church member, no matter which church it is, 
any period of time would probably answer that question, yeah, we're supposed to worship God, yes. But beyond that basic premise, Christians go in many different directions. How should we worship? When should we worship? Where should we worship? How often should we worship? These are just some of the issues that have impacted every group. Just think, for example, not going outside the Christian community, our Muslim friends who are very devout, they worship God how many times a day? Well, they tell him he's, he's great. They, they bow down. And, yeah, well, and they go through this five. Five times a day. Five times a day if you're really, really devoted. We should recognize that God does not expect every group in every part of the world to worship in exactly the same way. You know, I grew up in a very tight-knit local community of Adventists. I just assumed that all Adventists were like us, right? And then I went off to college. And I learned that things aren't quite, I mean, high school and then college, learned things weren't quite as, as confined as I thought. And then between my college years and my uh, medicine years, I spent three months working in Europe. I found out how people worshipped God in Europe. Very different. And then three or four years later, when I was just about to finish medicine, my wife and I spent three months in the highlands of New Guinea. And most of the, most of the Adventists there were from Australia or New Zealand. And they worshipped God in a different way again. And all of a sudden, I say, you know, there are different ways to worship God. Here is Germany, here is Australia, New Zealand, here is the United States. Hopefully that kind of experience open, broadens your perspectives. Well, for fear of being discovered, uh, let's see, we should recognize that God does not expect every group in every part of the world to worship exactly the same way. For fear of being discovered and killed, some have to worship as they are, hidden in their homes. Uh, I know a story that happened re quite recently of a woman who actually escaped from North Korea, yes. went to China, ran into some people there, I don't know exactly how it all happened, started listening to Adventist World Radio, for example, and was baptized. And she says, well, okay, I'll go back to North Korea and I'll, and I'll see if I can spread the gospel there. And it was very shortly after she went back, she was arrested and killed. Yeah. Was, uh, and that's, that's in our day. I just uh, read something recently. They know they've got, I can't think of the exact number, but it's something like roughly 10 or a dozen Chinese converts in North China, and they want to be baptized. Yeah. That's a whole different story again. Yeah. Well, others have beautiful church buildings where they can gather in large groups and worship God, assuming there's no COVID around. But we, but we must remember that God has clear plans for how we are to worship Him. We're not free to just worship Him in any way we like. So what does the Bible tell us about how God wants to be worshipped? Well, let's think about this for a moment. Is it a worship experience to go walking in Yosemite Valley? On a Sabbath afternoon? Yeah. You're dealing with creation that even by today's fallen world, it's still marvelous to look at. Yeah. There's so many beautiful, beautiful places in nature that you could you just think, wow, look what God has made here. Well, once again, we review, review the story in John 4. With Jesus talking to that woman, notice three key issues that Jesus pointed out. The first one is the qualifying expression, true worshippers. So you have to be a true worshipper, first of all, then. The next one, number two, is the fact that the Father seeketh a specific class of worshippers to, quote, to worship him, unquote. So there we have again now... God looks, he knows, he knows how to pick the ones that really are worshiping him correctly. Go ahead. Number three, the emphatic phrase that those who would worship must worship in a particular manner. Yep. That's from the Adolf Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, 94. It should be clear from these statements that God has not left us free to worship in any way we please. So why is God so particular? Is it because he wants us to worship him in spirit and in truth? 
Well, if you have a moment sometime, scan through the book of Leviticus and notice how detailed God intended for their worship to be. But while we are thinking through all those issues, do not forget that David was apparently worshiping God correctly by dancing around the ark. 1 Chronicles 15, 29. There is a spontaneous and subjective side to worship that is also pleasing to the Lord. But do so, we have anything in there that really says, God said, man, that is well danced, uh, David. No. <laughs> I mean, I'm really, really pleased. I, I, that's what I've been looking for a long time, and now you've finally done it, David. I don't, I don't think that's there. I think it's just yeah. a record of what David was doing. Yeah. And it, it, it disgusted well, he his wife. Get, he didn't get zapped like his other did. No, it, no, no that's true. A whole different true. era. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't think it was a situation of, well danced, David. Yeah. <laughs> In order to be sure that we are um, worshiping the God that is presented in Scripture, we must be careful in deciding how to worship God. It is so easy to set up our own version of God, which may be quite different from what the Bible presents. How do societies often come up with their ideas about God? One theory, which drives, draws heavily upon the philosophy of the father of modern sociology, Emil Durkheim, proposes that first, Societies develop a set of traits and values that they believe will ensure their survival. Second, they symbolize those traits and values with an animal, something that symbolizes their strength or courage or whatever. That animal is referred to as a totem, and the totem is a representation of the traits and values of a tribe. We also use totemic language to some degree. In the West, we say things like strong as an ox or wise as an owl or sly as a fox. We don't know that foxes are sly. We don't know that owls, owls are wise, but oxes are pretty strong. But we use those expressions and, you know, everybody understands it. Stage three occurs when little by little, the tribe begins to worship the animal that is a symbol Symbolic, symbolic representation of its own traits and values. Now the point becomes clear. If societies end up worshiping a deity that is simply a collective manifestation of their own, of its own traits and values, then religion is nothing more than a tribe of people worshiping itself. People may think this process applies only to some primitive tribe outside of Western culture but they should not be so hasty in their conclusions. There may be much truth in the adage often attributed to George Bernard Shaw that God may have attributed, I'm saying God may have created us in his image, but we have decidedly, we have decided to return the favor. We make God in our image. Lucifer in the garden painted a picture of God as a restrictive, lying, you shall not, you shall not surely die, insecure, threatened at the prospect of man's elevation deity. And you know the story there in Revelation, I'm sorry, Genesis 3, 1 to 6. But we'd say Lucifer was painting a rather accurate picture of himself. Adult Teacher's Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, page 95. It has been suggested, and it certainly must be true, that if the picture of God we have this year has not grown since last year, we are worshiping a graven image. Hmm. So how do we make our picture of God grow? Well, fortunately, we have... How a, do we correct it? We have uh, the Bible, and, uh, and we have opportunities to get together and, and study and uh, share ideas and uh, ch compare texts and see if we can expand our understanding about God. But I, th I think we should be doing study the Gospels and read the rest of the Bible in light of what we learned from the message yeah. that Jesus had. Uh, if, exactly. Rather than reading uh, the, the, the New Testament or the Gospels in, from what uh, point of view of the Old Testament, I think yeah. it's, it's it, uh, detrimental. Well, any misrepresentation of the truth about God is a distortion and will impact our worship. Remember that God's ways are not our ways, Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. So, um, just to stop there again for a little bit. Who is it that spends all his time finding ways to misrepresent God? Satan does. Yeah. Okay. 
Jim, is that next one yours? Okay, William Temple is believed to have said that worship is the submission of all of our nature to God. It is the quickening of the conscience by His holiness, the nourishment of mind, His truth, the purifying of imagination by His beauty, the opening of the heart to His love, the surrender of His purpose, excuse me, the surrender of will to His purpose, all this gathering up in adoration. How can we live each one of these points day to day? Adult wow. study guide. The first time worship was mentioned in the Bible was when Abraham told his servants that he and his son were going yonder to worship. And you remember that was the time when they went up onto Mount Moriah. Think of the parallels between what Abraham and Isaac did on that occasion and what God has done by sending his son to demonstrate for us the truth about himself. Why did God send his son? Demonstrate the truth about himself in order to give us a correct picture of God so that we can worship him in spirit and in truth. I mean, how, how many ways did Jesus compete and, and conflict with the, the people who thought they were worshiping, worshiping him in spirit and in truth? They thought they had it all, I mean, they had it spelled, drilled down to a yes. exact science, they thought. You do it this way, 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 and we have, you know, 25 gurus to, well, they were rabbis or whatever, to, to tell us exactly, this is the right way to do it. This is the way everybody must do it. And well, we, Jesus, can go, we can go back to Matthew 23 again. Yeah. He says, you, you scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, you're misrepresenting, the, uh, and seven times he said that. Yeah. Uh, you're misrepresenting us, and that must have pained Jesus the, the most. Uh, these these pious frauds uh, uh, kept it to themselves and nobody else. Well, and they were they were harsh they, because they had a harsh picture of God. Yes. Very much so, a very harsh picture of God. Misrepresented God, and I fortunately this week I was listening to some things uh, and while I was running from Ellen White, and she emphasized in a little bit different way something I hadn't seen before, and that's that. Even in his younger years, Jesus said things way back from the time he was 12. Jesus said things that stuck in some of their minds and said, this is, this is truth. And eventually, of course, we know that many of, the, many of them became Christians. Let's pray. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these truths, for the opportunity we have to serve you. May we worship you correctly. May we worship you for all the things you have done for us. May we worship you in spirit and in truth as you asked us to is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.